feel free at the end if you have any questions, but we'll probably go from Rick to Reg to Frank. And then, if it works, if you guys <laughs> just want to kind of all combine your comments, that will be fine too. Um, Rick, you're a uh, uh, graphic artist, correct? That is correct. And so you, I, I want you to um, notice in his book, and they're for sale up at the front desk, and we'll have Rick um, sign them too while you're here. But the graphics in them are beautiful, these early illustrations of the springs and all of the, the health um, uh, benefits of the, in fact, I was so interested to see Altamont Springs was actually a health spring. And um, I have one question uh, before we go on then. I'm native Miamian. We used to go swimming in the freezing Venetian pool. Is that an aquifer? Do you know? It's, it's spring fed. The water, spring they pipe the water in from the aquifer. I think uh -huh. it's from the Biscayne aquifer, and they pipe it in. Yes. And they pipe it out every single day. Okay. So Just, it's, it, that's why it's freezing. It's probably gotcha. 72 degrees. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, it, it was freezing, but we loved it anyway. Um, so, Rick, why don't you go ahead and um, start, and then you all jump in. Reg brought some of his wonderful photography and some wonderful maps that will sort of um, illustrate what um, Frank and uh, Rick are going to be talking about. So, just jump right in, all three of you. I'll just tell you kind of how I got on this adventure, and it all started at the Fountain View attraction in St. Augustine. Has anybody else been there? So, I always like to say I was a jaded furry. Yeah, I grew up in Gainesville, and my dad would never let us go to tourist tracks like that because thought they just wanted to take our money. But I went there, and it was kind of a life changing experience because there was incredible nature, and there was art, real archaeology, and incredible kitsch, which is why I went there to begin with. And from I was so inspired by that that I started a blog. And I, in my blog, I would travel around the state going to different places. But like for, uh, White Springs was one of the first places I went. And as I went, I started finding more evidence of other fountains of youth and, and things about springs. And as a result, my first book came out in 2013, Finding the Fountain of Youth. It documents the ways the myth of the fountain of youth has been used throughout Florida history and springs in, in particular. And that was about the time when you, about 2008, when you could get an underwater point and shoot. They're very, you know, they were cheap for the first time ever. You, you know, I remember when they had those disposable ones that turned out horrible. So I got one, and the first place I went was Wakaka Springs because I've been seeing these incredible photographs on Facebook everyone was posting and what I saw was horrifying you know, it was like green shag carpeting on the bottom of the spring and I had been there before and it was usually white sand and it was really um, in a horrible shape so next I went to Silver Springs and, I, and at that time there was a drought and um, that was before it was owned by the state I paddled up from the Silver River, River State Park and I saw the same thing everything was covered with a layer of slime so that kind of started my Springs advocacy side because history is kind of my main interest, but I don't think you can care about the environment and the history of Florida without getting involved with the natural resources. And our natural resources are very much at risk right now. I think we're really at a crossroads where if we don't do something, that there won't be any natural resources left, which maybe is a good place. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. My name's Reg Garner, and I'm a, a native Floridian as well, four generations, and uh, grew up for most of my life right here in Sanford on the St. John's River. My, uh, both of my grandfathers were avid hunter, fishermen, ran the river, and so from a very early age, I, I, you know, I've been on the St. John's River. And um, photography is my passion. I have a, a small gallery around the corner with my photography, but, uh, but uh, printing company is my career, and that's what pays the bills. So I work in downtown Orlando and live in downtown Sanford. But I run the river almost every weekend. Um, I just recently, uh, within a few weeks ago, got my, uh, my, my 
U.S. Coast Guard captain's license, and I'm going to be offering some uh, photographic tours for serious photographers and other people as well on a, a pontoon boat or a small skiff along the St. John's River. Um, but we're around the St. John's River, um, and I brought some maps and visuals and such too that you can kind of see the river. But um, I'll tell you just a quick funny story. My grandfather, who also lived in, in Sanford all of his life, uh, was an avid fisherman. He lived right up here on 16th Street. And um, he'd be out in the back, on the back street, cleaning fish from being out fishing. And one of his, <clears throat> his buddies or somebody come by, hey, Louie, where'd you catch them fish? Well, you know, no fisherman wants to tell his secret fishing spot. So his, his standard answer, I caught him between Lake Harney and the White Haired Bridge. And they said, oh, okay. <laughs> like they knew where that was. But, Maybe one percent of the people. That, and let me just show you where Lake Harney is right here, and this is down towards Men. This is Lake Monroe. Sanford's right here. The the red is the St. John's River. Um, Lake Jessup, Lake Harney. So there's Lake Harney, and if you go north to Lake Monroe, then this map picks up right here, Lake Monroe, and. The white haired bridge is Highway 44 in the land. <laughs> so, that's, uh, yeah. so that's my bring in. This is actually the most of the part of the, where I run the river. Um, mostly from Sanford down to Lake Harney and a little bit further below to the Econo Apache River, one of my favorite places. Afterwards, I've got some of my photography. Uh, around and uh, but, but that's what I do is um, is take pictures and uh, and make them large. Um, I've talked to you about a lot of things. We'll, we'll kind of split it up here in a minute. And I'll turn it over to you. But one of the things that most people don't realize is that there are wild horses on the St. John's River. There's wild horses in Gainesville on Payne's Prairie, and that's where most people know. And Cumberland Island and Georgia, there's and there's some up in like Maryland somewhere. I forget the mm -hmm. name of the town up there, but. 20 miles from here, on the St. John's River, there are 10 wild horses. And I don't know if you can see the picture behind me. There's, those are the 10 wild horses on the St. John's River um, running. Um, and uh, we, we go out there and we can usually find those horses when the water is, is high. Right now, the water level is very low, so they have a much larger territory to roam. And I haven't seen them in a few months. Uh, once the water starts coming up, I see them almost every weekend. So that's a little bit about me. Yeah, sure. I just want to thank uh, Janine, um, Bailey, and Robert from the gallery, and everybody in the audience for coming today for our talk. I think it's so important for us to be talking about water um, in Florida because it's right now is a really hard time with everything that's going on. If you just kind of read a little bit about the environment issues that we're having, uh, it's really crucial for us to do things. So I thank you for your time to come in and hear us talk. So my name is Frank, I'm originally from Paraguay and I've been living here for about 20 years and uh, I was living in Metro Orlando and I wanted to go outside you know, to explore the rivers and lake and I uh, started doing like cleanups of the rivers and then I met up with Ariel and other friends and we've been doing it for about 11 years now. Uh, hundreds of volunteers have joined us, we have removed tons of uh, trash out of the water and uh, we can see uh, really a difference that we do, you know, there's lakes that we go to uh, where there's a lot of trash and we work, we work, and a couple months later we can see turtles, we can see birds, uh, and it's really cool for us to be able to do that. And for me, you know, looking at these paintings here of this folk artist kind of makes me think about how the artist was driven to put things that they were feeling into to a canvas, you know, the energy, without really uh, like training or anything like that, just how they felt it, right? And I think the volunteers are really the same way, you know, we don't really know about biology and science and anything like that. We just feel like something that moves us to remove the trash out of the water. And uh, we really do because of the animals uh, that we see. Uh, first thing, me and my wife, we already seen like animals that got killed for turtles, uh, got caught on sharks, uh, on uh, scrunchies, on hair, uh, birds are not able to eat. It's really sad to see those animals, so we really try to make an impact. And, uh, uh, sadly, styrofoam is the one that is uh, the worst that we see because styrofoam breaks in a thousand pieces. Uh, turtles eat it, they float, and it's just a horrible death of like not being able to, to go down and the dive by sunstroke or being packed by birds. Uh, so it's, it's something that we do, and for us, you know, a lot of people be like, hey, you sacrifice your weekends, you're out there, 
And for me, it's like, yeah, it's a sacrifice, but it's not really a sacrifice. Like, you're in the water, you're in the sun, you're enjoying, uh, well, Florida has the best to, uh, to offer, you know. Uh, so I do want to invite everyone to come with us. Uh, anytime they can, they can check out Rico of Central Florida. We have 10 kayaks that you're welcome to come with us. If you don't want to kayak, it's fine. We also have grabbers who do uh, shoreline. Do you have a website too for people? Uh, we have We're a Facebook and Meetup. Yeah, Rico North Central Florida. Yeah. You guys are out there every weekend too. Yeah, yeah, we've been uh, for about, I'll say, 10 years here and there, almost every weekend in some form. Our volunteers are uh, doing it. We also have partnered with different organizations, uh, like Banning the Star Foam out of Orlando. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have really cool people that have come, you know, like volunteers that are just, you know, taking time out of their schedule to come. Uh, also, like environment celebrities, you would call it, like, uh, you know, the Costo, that's the granddaughter of uh, Jacques Costo. Uh, it was kind of cool when she came to Aquino because, you know, he did a lot of effort to uh, bring awareness to the springs. So it was kind of cool, he did a full circle to do a cleanup with, uh, with his granddaughter. Uh, we have done with indigenous youth from all over the United States that came together and we did a cleanup. Uh, and then later on we went and made gators because like, uh, they never been like seen a gator before. And I was like, hey, anytime you have a chance to eat a gator, you gotta eat it because if the gator has a chance, it's gonna eat you. So you gotta like do it that way too, you know. That's great. I have um, kind of like go back again. Rick, I, I read with interest the, the history, and I guess you all did some wonderful traveling over in Europe to see what their um, uh, bathing springs were like for health and so on and so forth. Um, but here in Florida, um, what was the exact, I don't want to get into a chemistry lesson, but what was the exact um, property of the water that made it healing. It's interesting because in Florida we have more first magnitude springs than any place else in the world. There's about 30, I think. But it's not the first magnitude springs that they would build these big healing spas at. It was usually small third magnitude springs, like a great example is Green Springs right across the Cleveland Road. Because you could smell the sulfur and the water has that opacity. It was the minerals in the water that supposedly gave it the healing powers. So places like Green Coast Springs, and then, you know, the north part of the river, and uh, Orange Springs off the Ogdawaha River, they, they're very small springs, but usually you smell them before you see them. <laughs> and the irony is, I was telling somebody about this earlier, during the British period, the 20 years when the British ran for uh, the naturalist William Bartram came down the river twice, once by himself and once with his father. And it, they came across several springs, Green Springs, Volusia Blue Springs and Salt Springs, I believe. But John Bartram, who was the big naturalist for King George, complained about the smell. And they had this long bathing tradition in England, but for some reason, he thought it smelled like bilge water. Later when they came, that's what they desired. That's the places, if it smelled bad, they would build a spa there. And you saw it happen again and again. And in my book, there's about 22 such places in Florida. The ones along the St. John's really developed first. and. Um, it's interesting to see because in a lot of these places there were indigenous people living there first. You know, there were shell mounds. A great example is De Leon Springs up the river. There's still a shell mound there with a house on it, and a lot there was there's been archaeology at almost every spring in Florida that shows the indigenous people lived there and there was this big because they believed the water was sacred. And a um, great example is Silver Lynn. There was this huge amphitheater that showed there were big religious festivals there where people would come from all over the southeast to honor the water there and have religious ceremonies there. So I think a sacredness of the water maybe is something that um, maybe we can all agree agree upon that, that there's some the water here in our state is incredibly important and that uh, if we don't preserve it, you know, there's really, we can't preserve life in this state. Mm -hmm. What is left of um, these old resorts? Is there are there any ruins standing? There's a few vestiges, like in Green Springs uh, across the lake. Yeah. There's a few steps. Um, mm -hmm. In North Florida, in White Springs, there's the kind of the bottom of a big spring house that was four stories high. So they knocked down the top stories and just kind of rebuilt the roof. But the the basement part is there. 
Suwannee Springs had this big um, stone wall put around it, and that wall still exists. Mm -hmm. And then in the Panhandle, there's a couple other places, but most of them had these beautiful Gilded Age hotels made out of wood, and of course, you know, wood in Florida. It either, mm -hmm. it either rots or burns down, mm -hmm. it doesn't burn down. So, um, mm -hmm. in terms of the architecture, there's not much left, mm -hmm. but there's relics that are, are left intact. Really interesting. Yeah, it makes me think about how we had, you know, hundreds and thousands of tourists coming to Florida back in the day to enjoy our waters, uh, and that kind of went away. And now we have, we still have hundreds of thousands of people coming to enjoy Florida, you know. Uh, it is, I say that it's most um, biggest thing in the economy is tourism in Florida. And, you know, prior to that is being the water, you know, like the fishing, just like, um, like the boats, taking photography. And a lot of that is being damaged. Um, you know, that picture that we have in our heads of the water cycle, you know, the clouds, rain, and it kind of goes like that, you know, we think that that's going on, but it's not because a lot of, like, just the habitat destruction, uh, payments that are being done, uh, where it's not going to the aquifer, you know, and even, like, drilling down for uh, fracking, uh, a lot of the, the, that aquifer is getting corrupted, and if you uh, look, it's just like a Swiss cheese that everything is kind of connected, and if one part gets bad, the whole gets bad, you know. And, you know, we hear about all these issues on the environment in California. And, uh, you know, we're here in Florida, this is going on too, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have to really, like, mobilize and really, like, pay attention to uh, where we're electing. Uh, because this is our, our home and water, and we have to protect it, you know. How would you suggest we do that? <laughs> um, I think the first thing is to enjoy uh, the water and to Get really out see there. what's going on, going out there. Uh, I can speak from experience that, you know, on, only after I started going to the rivers and lake that I started finding that, like, that deep connection, you know. I, I wasn't born here. I'm from a different country, from Paraguay. Uh, but, you know, when I started going down the rivers and you go down the other Cypress and, you know, you just feel that awe, that it's almost like you're going to, like, a cathedral uh, down mm. the river. And it's just, like, a magical experience. And it's, like, I felt like home, you know. And it was near the water. I was like, you know what, this is... This is my home now. I've been in here for 20 years. And, you know, I, I was born in Paraguay, but if you ask me where my home is, I'll say it's in the waters of Florida, you know. So I think exploration is like the first step of really like getting that connection to the, uh, the environment. Uh, and once we have that, then we can start doing the research and learning about what's going on mm -hmm. and uh, joining groups start doing uh, things to kind of uh, change, you know. Uh, for example, like the uh, thing going on right now with Nestle, where it's just like pumping out of the other uh, springs, and that thing is like as low as it is, you know. And they have a permit, I believe they're paying like $100 a year uh, to be able to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the thing with, with the, uh, you know, companies that bottle water, the, if you think about it, they have a factory, they don't have a factory that produces water, they can't, you know, why you can't create water, you can create plastic uh, to put the water in, you know. So they really are polluting our, our environment with the plastic that people are, are doing. And you know, it's like, I don't want to harp down on like water bottles. I use it all the time, uh, especially during hurricanes. You need it here in Florida, like, you know, there's emergency for that. Uh, but it's like, how can we be more sustainable with the, uh, with the water that we have here in Florida? Good point. Good point. So getting out there, so you're about to start your eco tours, or I'm calling right. them eco tours. I don't know if that's the right well, way to is. say it. I mean, uh, so many people will see my pictures, and uh, it looks like you're in the middle of South America somewhere with these beautiful yeah. cypress and the cypress knees, and and uh, they say, well, "Where is this?" And they're astounded when I say, "Well, it's 20 miles down the road." <laughs> and, you know, this large picture right here wow. is one of our favorite places. Um, just uh, that's part of the Econ Lakachi River where it comes into the St. John's. And um, it's just, and every time you go, it's a, it's a different place. I read a, a, a um, you know, something, a quote by, I, I think it was, I think it was Robert Frost. He says, every time I go to the river, it's a different river. And I'm a different man. Oh. And it's so true because you go and the river changes and, you, and, and just what you see and experience and um, and it's in our backyard. I mean, if you look at you know, I, I think I'll stand up and show you this map again. But the state of Florida, I, I love Florida. You know, I'm a native Floridian. I'll put this back here so you can see it. But I just love this map because it shows you know, Florida. There's no place in the world like it. it is so unique. 
uh, you know, and we have so many different ecosystems. You go south below the freeze line in South Florida and Miami area, you know, you get plants and wildlife and orchids and, and things that you don't see up here. And then you get up in the panhandle and then you get into Georgia. It's just a whole different thing. But, um, you know, I think most people realize the St. John's River, which is, you know, right here, um, is, is about 310 miles long. And uh, I think most people know it, it flows north, one of the few rivers that flow north. Not the only one, but a few. Uh, but it starts down near Melbourne, Florida. Um, Helen Blazes, or there's a couple of Lake Washington. I'm not, there's a couple of disputes on where it actually starts. Gabby, where does it start? You probably know. I've heard Blue Lake. <laughs> a Blue Lake, okay. And it flows north uh, 310 miles, and it goes out to Jacksonville right here. And you can see it. I love flying commercial airlines, and I always try to get on the seat by the window where I can see the St. John's River. It's, uh, you know, you can just see it, and you can see all the tributaries off it, the Oklawaha, the, uh, the, the Econ, and, um, and you can even see, you know, if you've heard of the Florida Ridge Line, uh, you know, you see the Florida Ridge Line right here, and you can see this is just a satellite map I got off of Google and uh, printed out large. And, uh, I put some of my favorite places and so forth. But Florida is just such a, a unique place, and that's just what I wanted to say is, is, uh, is, is to experience it. All you got to do, is, I mean, many places you can drive to, and there's so many hiking trails. The Kilby Trail you were talking about that goes along the, uh, the Econ, um, or, you know, go out in a boat, or, and that's what I'm going to be doing is taking people out, but, uh, but go in a boat, and you can see places that you would just never realize that you could experience. And uh, again, you know, this is, you know, this is, um, this map, most people look at it, they don't recognize it because it doesn't have street names on it. It's got rivers on it and lakes. But if you know the lakes, here's Lake Monroe. So here's where we are right here in Sanford. North is kind of like this. Um, I highlighted most of the river in, in orange so you can see it. But you can see the, um, you know, the old river channel and government cut is right here. It goes down to, um, you know, um, Bullet Lake Park and Lemon Bluff and, and, and winds around and goes into Lake Harney. But all of this is just absolutely, it's just down the road from us. And if you have a boat or have access to somebody with a boat, you can just um, go out and find some of these places. Deep Creek is one of my favorite places just north of, uh, and some of my photographs are in these bins as well. And you feel free to look through them. And, I sell them for like, you know, 40 or $50 for a print, but, uh, and then I make big prints too. Um, my, I make prints that are, I have this one like um, nine feet tall by 25 feet wide, you know, printed as wallpaper, because that's what I do for my, my career, I'm a large format printer. But again, you just gotta get out there and experience these places, and, uh, and you, you'll see places that you never, it's like a cathedral, you go yeah. in those places, and you know, you have, you, kayak a lot and you just they give you, all you need is a kayak is just to get out there. It's just absolutely stunning. When did you start taking photos? Well I started when I was in junior high school with film. My dad was a hobbyist photographer and we made you know prints in the bathroom and the red safe light and the trays and so forth nice. when there was film. And yes. so but I kind of made the transition over the years to uh, but over the past I'd say twenty years I've been more of a serious photographer and uh, selling some of my work. I have some of my work in some hospitals and area uh, healthcare places and things like that as well, so. Awesome. So Rich, how early do you have to get up to get some of your shots? Um, my buddies Wayne and Steve are better. What time do you leave? You meet at my house at 4.30 in the morning? <laughs> oh boy. And, uh, and that's what time we have. Depends on where we're going and it depends if it's, you know, what, what time the sun rises. Typically, to answer your question, we want to be at our spot with the tripod one hour prior to sunrise. Wow, yeah. So then we back it up from there. So, okay, it's gonna take 30 minutes to get to the boat ramp. It's gonna take just 15 minutes of just, you know, shooting the breeze. And, you know, we, <laughs> and we're pretty on a mission though, but, but you wanna be there one hour because what happens is 30 minutes before sunrise, the sky, 45 minutes before the sky starts to lighten up and it starts getting beautiful and so forth. So you got to get up early and if you want to do that. And that's what some of my tours are going to be with serious photographers is, you know, if you want to do that kind of, you know, we need to leave at 4.35 o'clock in the morning. But it pays off. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I've followed you on Facebook for a long time. It's the, the light that really makes it's sense. It's all about the light. Because 30 minutes after sunrise, 
it's done pretty much. I mean, we can walk around in the, in the woods and find some cool stuff to photograph, but the sky is done. Mm -hmm. And then in the evening, we do sunsets, of course, too. And you know, from sunset to about 45 minutes after sunset, the sky is still very beautiful and so forth. But, uh, so your ego trips, they don't start so early, I hope. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We try to go before it gets hot. Yeah. So I'll say around 10 in the morning is when we, uh, we set out and we try to do for like an hour. Uh, but usually the volunteers get too excited and they stay there long and we have to like bring them back uh, because we find such like a lot of crazy things. Uh, you know, anytime that I find any kind of, kind of like a religious offering, uh, mm -hmm. I like to leave it. Uh, I don't like to like mess with, you know, Santeria, Brujeria, that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, but I remember one time we found a vase that was about, uh, you know, this big. Uh, it was, uh, the top was uh, cemented and it was all hand painted uh, with like figures or like drawings of like that. And it looks almost like a person's life that they were depicting on this, on this huge vase. And, I was like, let's just leave it there, you know, like they probably was like somebody that sees and put in the river, a lot of cultures uh, do that, you know. But one of the volunteers like, no, let's take it, you know, and, and we took it out and uh, we uh, were gathering, you know, today we take a picture of the trash or anything like that. And I saw the volunteer, they're just, they kept looking at the vase and I was like, you know what, the person's gonna, he's gonna run with the vase, you know. We took the picture, the person grabbed the vase and they ran out of it. And uh, I never got to see the vase again, but I wish like we, uh, Kept it or put it back because it was the most beautiful thing I saw. Where did we get that out of here? I think, it an urban lake? Yeah, it was an urban lake. I think it was by the uh, yes. uh, French Hall Park. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I think it's uh, the stores there. But it was, yeah, it was about this big, uh, you know, hand painted, uh, you know, with a, like a person's life and they're, they're like born and going to school and that kind of stuff. I thought it was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And each person that, you know, comes to the cleanup finds like something like different. And, and they like that too, you know. That reminds me of a, of a folk art tradition um, yeah. called memory jugs. And often um, in African American custom, they would, when a person would die, they would take up a jug, usually made by a potter, and then press their mementos into that jug, and it would be a memory jug. And, and now, of course, you see them on the secondary market. They're very, very um, touching. Those would be kept at grave sites too, right? Yes, uh, they would sometimes put them on the grave, or sometimes they would keep them at home to remember the deceased person. That sounds about what I saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was oh, kind of like sad. the person's like life. Yes. Yeah, that's what I got the question uh -huh. was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, a spring that's near um, uh, the Wakaiba area called Ginger Ale Spring. Yeah. And it's a really small basin, and, and the story is um, the, the heir to the beam and chewing gum family um, fortune wanted to make ginger ale and bottled water there, so he built a little basin. It reeks of sulfur, but it's not open to the public. You have to know where it is. And when you go there, there's little offerings in the trees. There's angels and um, stuff like that. So the first time I went there, I, do you know the photographer John Moran? Yes. I had him on the phone because he had been there and I, he told me how to find it because I could not find it on my own. So I went to show a friend of mine the second time and right where you got off the trail, somebody had put a dead alligator. Oh and my it, God. The smell was horrible so you couldn't find it. So I couldn't find the spring by smell because usually you can smell the sulfur. And we walked all through the woods and couldn't find it and it, it was like it disappeared. Like the spring did not want to be found that day and it just vanished. Oh. So I haven't been back since. I hope it's still there. Could you yeah. take a cruise with us? I was going to say, I've always wanted to go there. Can I go? I, um, can you take I, don't, I try not to trespass. Mm -hmm. If I can get permission, because I think it's um, Semple County owns the land around it, oh. I would do it in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like to trespass. Do you have a comment? <laughs> that's where um, I-4, in the that's killed the little Wakaiba River right now, that's where, oh. right adjacent to Ginger Ale Springs, is where the sediments came oh. from the I-4 contract. Still there. <laughs> yeah, well, at least that's good. <laughs> we actually have a bus uh, outside after this talk. We're going to jump in. And then we have the cameras. We got everything. Yeah. I think some of the best springs around, though, are right here in Central Florida between Rock Springs and Macaiba Springs, Green Springs, Volusia Blue, Deland Springs. There's a lot of great springs. Rattlesnake, you know, some of the smaller ones in the Seminole State Forest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, um, 
rattlesnake and moccasin springs. You got to know where they are. Yeah, those are. Right. But you know the one that you mentioned that stands out to me is Green Spring. How many know where Green Spring is? A lot of yeah. people. Yeah. 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 Green Spring is directly across Lake Monroe, yeah. and it's a Volusia County Park, and there's a parking lot, and a big pavilion, and restrooms, and great houses, but it's one of the most yeah. beautiful, it's like you I go back in time yeah. when, you, when you go there. And the color is, it looks like jade, yeah. but then sometimes it looks emerald, yeah. depending on the, you know, the over, if the sky's overcast, it's going to look yeah. one way, and there's this beautiful live that goes right over, mm -hmm. so it makes a great photograph. And my dad used to tell me, he grew up in Sanford, and he said that uh, the Long before it was a you know county park, he said he and his buddies would take a boat from Sanford and go across, and there was a little Indian trail that you had to know where it was. And because it was hidden back there, like many of those in civil woods and some of those places that you go to, that people didn't know they were, were there. But it's just so magical when you go there. It's just I, I recommend anybody go there yeah. this afternoon. Yeah. It's just absolutely yeah. <laughs> I stopped, we were time I go through there, and the first tourist hotel in this area in the 1840s was where the spring run from Great Springs entered Lake Monroe. There was a huge shell mound there. And Cornelius Taylor built the first hotel there in the 1840s. Wow. 1840s. Well, is the mound still there? No. They, they we drive on it every day. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But there's other springs back there if you charm around at the woods. Yeah, there are. Yeah. That little creek, that little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The prize springs. And they're very sulfurous, and there's some of them just kind of trickle out yes. from the base of trees. Mm. There's a lot of springs. Another really beautiful place is, is Juniper Springs. Probably one of my most favorite, one of one of my most favorite places is Juniper Springs. And I can remember one of my earliest camping trips with my parents and my sister. And I mean, I have pictures of me five years old camping there, but the spring is the, the run, the, the, the kayak run. So it's about a four hour run, but my goodness, it goes through Ocala National Forest and, and pristine land is just up at Juniper Springs. So that's a national, um, national park. Yeah. It's actually a national forest, but there's a place right by it called Fern Hammond where there's yes. sand boils that come up through the ground. It kind of looks like those things you see in Yosemite where there's mud boils, but these are sand boils. And it's covered with live oaks. It's, it's really hard to get a good photograph because you have these bright sand boils and these trees are creating shade. It's magic. Would you say that's quicksand? Would you sink into it? <laughs> I'm like, I'm getting quicksand vibes right so now. So <laughs> I, know, I know divers who have tried to go into springs like that. Uh -huh. and. Um, I heard what they do sometimes is get pantyhose and put, you know, their air tanks and stuff like that and push them through a head in order oh, to get through. Oh my gosh. That's what I heard. This well, is loose sand. Yeah, and, no, it's, and it's only yeah. about three Yeah, because once you get through, you know, there's a whole cave system and the aquifer wow. and all that stuff. Everything so, just oh, right outside our doorstep. Yeah. Right outside. Yeah. Ready to jump. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you pick when you're, where you're going to go to clean up? We go to different uh, lakes uh, throughout uh, Central Florida. Uh, we have done like Lake Eola. I thought it was pretty cool when we got permission uh, to do that. Uh, but we try to find a place that has a good parking, that's like a good one, maybe restrooms. And that has a balance of enough litter where the volunteers will be able to be able to take things, but don't feel overwhelmed. Uh, because there's lakes, for example, Clear Lake uh, near uh, I-4. Uh, we have to take volunteers there, you see a whole new crew, and uh, then you never see them again. You know, <laughs> they, they get it's too much. It's too much. So we just try to do like a balance of uh, where the lakes, and we do uh, Lake Conquer, Lake Sibelia, Underhill, uh, Underhill. Uh, we do here the, uh, by the, uh, you know, the overpass, what is it called? The marina. The marina, uh, we do it right there. Uh, that one is a cool place because you can see like manatees. Uh, they come like near uh, the kayak. Oh, Wayside yeah. Park? Yeah, Wayside yeah. Park, yeah. So we try to kind of stay in the uh, Central Florida region, uh, but we do go sometimes to like that as well. So since they did the styrofoam ban in Orlando, have you noticed the difference in the amount of styrofoam? I feel like, yes, we, we have a little bit, uh, especially on the downtown lakes. Uh, we don't see a lot that polar cup. That one is like yeah. the worst, and you know, <laughs> it's like, uh, 
when I see it, it just drives me crazy because the styrofoam is for me, it's just, mm -hmm. it breaks and it's right. just a thousand hundred pieces right. and you know, a volunteer can go and stay like three hours in the same spot without moving and you're still taking the, uh, the same cup, you know. And that stuff is valid for animal. It really looks like uh, snail, snail like snail shell, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's what you know has the uh, the animals eat it, and then they start the other uh, the whole thing. So, mm -hmm. and you guys uh sort of notice a lot of construction debris, right? Like yeah. from overpasses, this I four Ultimate Project, for instance. Mm -hmm. I know that you guys were recently out in Lake Ivanhoe, which is right by I four, and there was tons of construction debris. Does the city do anything? Do you guys notify the city when you see this? Yeah, we, we notify the city, and I think we have a good relationship with all the different um, parks and recreation mm -hmm. uh, throughout, you know, Winter Park, uh, Orlando. Uh, but every once in a while, like we do have like a police that kind of has us because they think that we're charging people to go uh, on the water. And we tell them, no, look at us. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody <laughs> would pay to, to do pay this. To be, you know, picking up trash like this. Uh, and they, they just don't believe it. And they'll be like, well, you don't have the right uh, uh, equipment uh, to be taken out. So we, we definitely like sometimes get pushed back from city officials. But when we go back and we talk to them, they're really uh, listening and very caring and, and, and they kind of send our, um, our, our battle, you know. And uh, one thing that I do want to add is that our equipment is out from the pockets of all the volunteers. Uh, we don't have any kind of like corporate or uh, donor, uh, you know, like the gas that we put in a truck. Uh, you know, the, 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 the trailer that the, our canoes are, that was built with scrap from, uh, from the trash that one of the volunteers was able to put together. Mattress frame. Yeah, mattress frame. Uh, and yeah. One of the volunteers is an engineer, right? <laughs> yeah, he's <laughs> an <laughs> yeah, uh, engineer. Uh, and, and for me, it's just phenomenal to see the, the love that people have for, for the, where they live and just being able to uh, spend the time and the care, you know, like, you know, washing the canoes after the clean up, you know, uh, but just making it easy for people that want to join to be able to come in one or two hours uh, to give back. And, uh, you know, if you ever want to come with us, like I say, please come. If you don't want to be in a kayak, we have like grabbers you can walk around. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, we do cleanups and we focus on the water, but not in the parking lot near where the uh, the water is. But everything is in the parking lot is going to run to the to the water. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like you know, come. We have a lot of stuff for us to do with our grabbers, and uh, also we are uh, running for best uh, activist here in Orlando for uh, Orlando Weekly. Uh, so if you want to go there on the website, you can vote for us. I think it would be really cool for us to get uh, nominated. Uh, like. One or two places. So I have an idea. Yeah. I live on a um, urban lake called Lake Hourglass in Orlando. Oh, yeah. 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 And I see firsthand all the debris. You know, straws, a lot of straws, a lot of styrofoam, a lot of caps. Oh, little, um, those little cigars. Yeah. Yeah. So I have always thought it would be really fun to collect it over a span of a year or two. And just see how much I got, and then make something out of it. Mm. How cool would it be mm -hmm. if we collected all the trash from your stuff and on your trips and stuff, and brought it here and made some <laughs> cool kind of environmental art? Piece? Bring it inside here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, clean it up first. Like great idea. <laughs> and then because I've seen other, I've seen people no, do that on awesome. the beach. You know, I've mm -hmm. seen stuff where they've made art installation pieces just out of flip flops mm -hmm. that they pick up mm -hmm. on the beach. But I always thought, let's take all this garbage because we're just putting moving it into a landfill. Yeah. So what if we repurposed it into a piece of art? Because a lot of it is plastic that has color that you could use and reinterpret. I don't know. Just like that. No, that's, I mean, that's folk art. <laughs> that's, like let's that. take a look at the walls. Especially in Wild Tips, we uh, got, I don't know, probably like 100 of them. We were, made, we were able to spell the Central Puerto Rico with. Just little, with the little just cigar teeny. Steps, yeah, from one cleanup yeah, yeah. Oh, it's crazy. I don't know when that became a fad, but they're everywhere. They make wood ones too, which are fine, but there's so many classic ones that are fun all the time. Have y'all seen a big increase in like mask or gloves? A little bit, surprisingly not that much. Yeah, but a few. Yeah. That's comforting. Yeah. yeah. Maybe they don't float. Maybe they're on. The they're floor. down. They big, yeah. <laughs> in the middle basin and I got kind of waylaid by uh, 
COVID and getting out to meet more people and things, but uh, the Riverkeeper is a nonprofit organization. And we focus on the advocacy, being the voice for the river. And the river right now has quite a few problems. Lake Jessup right now has a toxic algae bloom in it, blue green algae. And we're working with Seminole County, City of Winter Springs, and different things to advocate to make sure that they invest the right amount of money. And then also, um, I'm working on the Little Wakaiba River, which starts all the way up by the fairgrounds over there um, in uh, Orlando by Mercy Drive area, and it flows through and it goes all the way to the to the Big Wakaiba, and um, it actually has some debris and uh, it's, it's blocked about 20 square acres of it, and there is no river flowing. It just kind of stops after the springs by by uh, close to that. I'm also working on projects with the Big Wakaiba River. Um, we have some things with the springs. There's a lot of nutrients that are produced by our septic tanks and produced by our um, the way we treat our wastewater. I have a utility over there that we pay for, Utilities Inc. They had a 1.2 million gallon raw sewage spill into the Wakaiba River about a year and a half ago. And I've been trying to work with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to make sure that they enforce the rules properly to make it not cheaper to you know have those kinds of issues. Of course, it was an accident and things like that. But so, um, there are a lot of water quality issues, like he was saying about all the plastics and things. So one of the, the pollutions I focus on is called non-point source pollution. And that's the pollution that runs off the land when the first rain starts to fall. They, kind of, uh, they call it the first flush of rain. So, and it takes the oil and the gas and the cadmium from your tires and all that stuff. It all, you know, accumulates on the land and the longer it before it rains, it doesn't run off. So that's like some really bad water that goes into the areas. And then also we have very large fish kills um, in, in Lake Jessup and different things from, from the oxygen levels being gone because of uh, treated wastewater and untreated wastewater. So there's a lot of pollution issues that we don't hear about. And I love talking about the environment through art and trying to inspire people to, um, to do it, but we really are in crisis mode. There's a, a, a group called the Central Florida Water Initiative, and they're planning for all this new growth in Central Florida that's coming, because they're expecting we're gonna have three million more people here within the next couple of years, and you know, it's a beautiful place to live, but if we wanna keep our natural systems healthy, or just to get them healthy again, we're gonna need everyone to, to kind of come together and, and make the polluters responsible and make the agencies do their jobs and enforce on the polluters. So that's a lot, and I probably took up too much time, but um, stjohnsriverkeeper.org, it's pretty easy, and I'm Gabby Milch, and I'm the Middle Basin Advocacy Director, and I'm um, going to be having a, a series of workshops coming up in the next three months, uh, we'll, we'll end in September, where we want to hear from you about what kind of problems you see in our Florida waterways too. So we're going to have two listening sessions, you can look it up on Facebook if you like, or afterwards we can connect up and I can show you where to go, but really we do need more advocates, and thank you all for all you do for our waterways. Yes. Thank Thanks for that info, Gabby. Or, uh, questions for the audience? Just a question. I, yeah, the trash is easy to see, and we know to pull it out, but you know, all those blobs of green goo that are everywhere, is there any way to get that out and compost it or reuse it in some way? And does it do any good just to try to pull it out of the water? I mean, I know that there's some things like hydrilla, it's best removed physically because it sits on the. And you know the answer in my mind is not spraying, you know, because I think that just compounds the problem. As, I, as far as algae, I don't know. What I always like to recommend when I do talks like this is try planting native plants in your yard and don't plant stuff that needs fertilizer and watering constantly because that can make a huge difference. It, not just in terms of the stuff that soaks into the aquifer, but in terms of the amount of wildlife that it will foster. You know, you'll give the bees and the butterflies something to eat, and you'll give the 
bird something to eat, and all that kind of stuff. If you plant native plants, these exotics do nothing for the environment. They just take away. And if we yeah, all did that, that yeah. we'd have a much better situation. And I think that's the single most, other than throw out everybody in Tallahassee, mm -hmm. that's the single easiest thing. No, I agree. Uh, the most planted and water, you know, plant in the United States is lawn. Yes. And it's kind of funny if you're going to try to explain, let's say that alien came from another planet and you're trying to explain, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, this is a plant that we uh, water and uh, we put too much labor, you know, we hire people, we have all this, and they're like, can you eat it? It's like, no, we can't really eat it. Uh, what can you do? It's like, we can look at it, you know? Uh, but it's creating so much fertilizer that's going in the water and creating those uh, blooms, you know? And that's really impacting the uh, manatees also, uh, especially this year with the diet off of the manatees. And it just, it, it breaks my heart anytime that, you know, animals are suffering, and especially a manatee, like dying of hunger, uh, you think of manatees, you know, like lard and stuff like that, they're hungry, they cannot eat. Uh, and it's just, it's sad. And I think it really starts with us, like, rethinking our lawns. Uh, I know in our, our landers organization that does uh, flea farming, they turn lawns into gardens. I think that's a great initiative. Uh, but I think it's really up to us to be able to kind of start a change and do uh, plant natives. And it's hard, you know, especially, yeah. uh, like, you know, I don't want to, like, point fingers, but my lawn is not that great, you know. Uh, <laughs> but our, our neighbor's lawn is, like, beautiful. You know, it's green, and it's just, like, it's, it looks almost like neon green. I don't know if he spray paints. <laughs> you know, uh, and I'm trying to turn it into, like, a native, and with natives, like, you, you, you don't have to water all the time, you know, you don't have to do these things, but it's just really, like, a shift in culture of like going away from the lawns mm -hmm. uh, that is killing our waterways or animals mm -hmm. and we're not even like eating it you know and mm -hmm. i think we found so much more joy in our yard with how, just leaving it to be natural and, and how uh, and not fertilizing it and worrying about how pretty it looks because it looks to me it's beautiful but we see all of this wildlife and birds the birds are always in our lawn because we don't have pesticides. Yeah, and fertilizer, and it, it's amazing how how much wildlife I can look out my window from my office and, and see <laughs> in any given day. So, yeah, it's great. You know, um, some of the plants that I see when I'm kayaking. You know, like uh, spider lilies and scarlet hibiscus and stuff. Have those in your backyard. You know, the, the scarlet hibiscus. I mine finally bloomed today, but I know by the time I go home this afternoon, it'll be gone. And so far, it will last. But you know, for one day, that beauty was right there in my backyard. You know, and it's great to see it in the wild. But it's also great to see it in the backyard too. And um, we can help preserve this stuff in the wild.
so happy that you live here mm -hmm. in not only Florida, but Central Florida. So we have them at the desk, and Rick has graciously agreed to sign any books that you might want to purchase. And I thank you, and Reg has his, um, his photographs here and some of his larger pieces. And I have one thought I did have is, I thought, oh my goodness, how many people are out at Disney World today? And if they could only see that, would it really make a difference? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We get on that point. Exactly, exactly. And I think you ought to do at least once or twice a year, maybe non-photographers that yes. might want to go out. I'm going to do non-photography too. Okay, good. Yes. That was the main point of this event. I know so, we could go on in this car. I'm on it. I'm on it. Okay. <laughs> or maybe some artists would like to go out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we got a group right here. Okay. All right. Okay, well, we, we got refreshments in the back, and it's um, uh, spring water. <laughs> <laughs> I will ask you about that.